So our next speaker today is Cameron Nalen, um, probably wins the award for most jet-lagged presenter today. Um, I actually met Cameron's data before I met Cameron, and that by itself is an interesting description of what the future of science looks like. So I'll let him fill that in. Cameron? Thanks, Greg. Um, this. So it, I'm really glad that Greg gave a, a short introduction. The last time I spoke in Canada, um, I actually spoke directly after um, Greg and he gave the talk I wish I'd given. That's not the first slide. <laughs> it's a great slide and um, when we get there I hope I'll still get the laugh. Okay, so go ahead and do a quick, a quick um, survey. How many of you would, would describe yourself as software engineers? And how many are sort of tech web geeks? And how many of you are scientists who've never written a line of code? All right, so that's, that's a starting point. Um, so what I want to talk about is, in a sense, what the whole meeting was about, I hope, how we can rethink the way the web could be applied to the way we record the research we do. I'm an experimental researcher, I'm a practicing scientist. I like to think that one day that means I'll start to get it right. Um, just to be a little bit clear, um, you are free to do any of this stuff you like. Um, I will add to that that you are allowed to take notes, you are allowed to think, um, and you are allowed to disagree with me as well. Um, some of you may have seen some of the stuff over the last couple of weeks um, in a number of journals about issues about people blogging, microblogging, taking pictures, video of things. It's nice to be clear. So I need to thank a few people. Um, I make no bones out of the fact that uh, a lot of my thinking is based on the thinking of a lot of other people. If I've seen any distance it, at all, it's because I've stood or sat on the tweets and blog posts of other people. Um, one group that I want to thank in particular is the group of Jeremy Frey at the University of Southampton who've done a lot of the development of some of the tools that I'll show you on the way through the talk. So, to start with the question of what is the web good for? I mean, it is it's pretty good at some sorts of stuff. And so it might make sense that we can apply some of that to doing science, practice the science better. So if we ask what the web is good for, it's, it's pretty good at publishing stuff, particularly self-publishing stuff. Options for subscribing to things. Um, if you're wondering what that is, it's actually a water fountain at a university somewhere in the Midwest. Um, it's great for pulling stuff together, syndicating stuff into one place, remixing, mashing up. This is actually a, what's called the Blug. Anyone old enough to remember what a Moog is? All right, so some of you get the joke. So this is a tool, it's an analogue tool actually for taking RSS feeds and mashing them up. So it pulls sentences from different blog posts and sticks them together in a fashion based on that. It's really cool, completely useless, but, but great fun. Um, so we can do all these kinds of things. We can publish and we can publish in small fragments. We can aggregate and subscribe to people or to things. We can syndicate stuff and embed it into other things in useful ways and we can remix. And in particular, we can collaborate, um, something that's, that's at the core of, of science, hopefully. So what do scientists need in, in that sense? Well, we need to publish. Um, we need to subscribe. We hopefully slightly greater diversity of publishing outcomes in this day and age. Um, we need to syndicate. This is uh, the A version of the CRC handbook, which is basically a collection of published data that's been brought into a book that most chemists will have on their shelf and may occasionally actually refer to the hardbound version. That data has been syndicated from a vast number of publications into this book. And that's a, that's a very common approach in science. Um, we need to remix. All right, so not necessarily just about mixing liquids together, but actually what's going on here is this is a column through which a solution of biological molecules is being passed and those molecules are being purified. The resin that's in the column came from polymer chemistry of the 50s and 60s. The molecules that are being purified come from immunology. The process by which they're made came from molecular biology. And the machine that these things are going to be used in was an incredible um, development of robotics and laser physics brought together to solve biological problems and biological assays. We pull things together, we reuse them, we remix them. That is what we do in science. Science is, in a sense, the ultimate open source activity. 
So, so the web does all this for us. So that's good. So there's one thing that perhaps the, the consumer web, at any rate, doesn't do quite so well. And again, this is you know, a really important part of science, doing your controls pro properly, validating that your machine is doing the right thing. And as we've just heard, you know, there are some things we can learn from, from computational science about doing this properly, um, whether it's version control, putting data up in, in version control systems, some interesting work being done on using um, GitHub as a place to put data, and unit testing. So Greg and Titus can complain about my unit tests later. I, I expect there'll be a test. So, so we're covered, right? So we'll, actually, I'll give up. I'll stop now. And we've we've done, the, done the job. But clearly, the web is going to solve all the problems that science has. And, and we just, yeah, it's, it's basically done, right? Well, no, I wouldn't be here if, if that was the case. Here is a paper. It happens to be, oh, that's interesting. Going a bit sideways. OK. Um, here's a paper. It happens to be one of my papers. Um, this is a PDF. So you, know, you go to the website, it's an open access, you can go and look at this paper, that's, that's easy. But you know, click on the graph, does that take you through to Gapminder or something like that? No. Are the links to other bits of the literature hyperlinked? No. Um, is the fact that these are samples that are described in the methods part of the paper linked up so that you can click through and check what the details were? You can click back through to the raw data and check what was going on in the detail? No. The whole scientific record is fundamentally a dead document in a world in which we have a rich, interlinked, networked document set of knowledge on the web. Admittedly, it's mostly pictures of cats and pornography, but actually the fact that it's wired up makes it useful. So it's the links between things that make Google work, that make the web work. And at the moment, we have a scientific record that looks like a great big monolithic document that incidentally you can't really edit. But that's, a, that's a separate issue for another day. So can we take it, from, to take it away from this monolithic large-scale document and make it look more like something like this? A network of pieces of knowledge that are wired together in a way that, in a way that makes sense. This is incidentally a picture of um, neural pathways in the brain that I've stolen from, from Wikimedia Commons. So, what I'd argue is that we need the record of science to be um, of these fragments, these pieces of knowledge, objects, research objects that we can share. They need to be loosely coupled so that we can reassort them, move them around, see what sort of new shapes and, and interactions we can make. But they need to be tightly wired to each other so we understand their context, and we understand the, what the role they play and the things that they're doing. So, what is a fragment? What is a piece? What is, the, what is the smallest unit of science? We talk a lot as scientists about the minimal publishable unit, which is paper. So, as I said, again, this has gone slightly sideways for some reason. It worked fine on my laptop. Um, a paper is too big a piece. The, the, the traditional minimal publishable unit is too big, too monolithic, and indeed doesn't even fit most of the science that we do in the 21st century. Here's another fragment of science. This is a particularly cool one. So this is, um, this is in effect, the public announcement of NASA saying that they'd found water on Mars, made on Twitter. Um, and this is probably one of the great triumphs of public relations of the 21st century. Um, the Mars Phoenix probe, um, which was personed by, by a person sitting at JPL, um, had something like 400,000 followers. You know, in the days before Oprah. Um, but you might argue this is too small. I mean, it's a claim, it's a statement, but there's no link back from this to the data. What I want to argue is that a useful minimal unit of science in terms of capturing it and communicating it is about the size of something that you want to put in a blog post. So this is the laboratory notebook of one of my students. This is the system that was developed by Jeremy Fray's group, the University of Southampton, largely by one of his students, Andrew Milstead. Um, I play the role of breaking it and asking for new functionality and seeing what happens. Um, just, just to briefly point out, and I'll come back to right at the end, if you look at the top left corner, I'm not logged in. You can go and look at this if you want to 
it, it's completely open as it's recorded, as, as the students record what happens in the lab, it goes up on the web. At the top we have a procedure, a sort of couple of lines, this is what I did, this is what I've, I've been doing, this is what I've made, these are the things that I've used. And the key thing is that there's a link in there right at the top. So regardless of what meaning behind this is, essentially some solid stuff was resuspended in some buffer. And that buffer is a link. And where would you expect that link to go? It goes to a description of the buffer. This is a bottle, an object, sits in our lab on a shelf. Actually, it's in the cold room. Putting that aside, it's, it's an object, it's something that's a useful unit that we can play with and talk about. And by linking from the procedure back to the object, we've created some sort of description of what the relationships between those two things are. So I just want to show you a, few th few, a little bit of this live, this video works. Yep. So this is, this is, a, this is my lab notebook. So this is a, a data file. Um, as I said, I'm a real scientist. That means I generate Excel files. Um, we've got the date, the person who did it. So you've got some metadata automatically captured by this idea of, your, of the standard sort of blog approach. You've got actually some versioning in there. It's not as sophisticated as, as, a, as, a, as a full versioning system, but there are changes that were made. So we have a record of that process, how it was changed over time. But actually what's probably more interesting is we have this data and that's linked back to the process that it was created in. So this is the process that was used to create that piece of data. We have a sample, a set of samples, a set of data. Each one of those has their own post. And you can go back again to the sample. The sample is created by process and you can follow those links through, through a, a set of a set of posts over time. So you end up with a, with a situation that is basically a set of posts that describe physical objects. So this is quite similar in some ways to the way people talk about the web of objects, the web of physical objects, trying to create a digital identity for them on the web. And then we have the digital objects, the data, the kind of thing that you guys perhaps are more familiar with handling, and the links between them. So we have process, object, process, object. And we link all these up together course, they don't need to necessarily come from a person. Um, as far as possible, the object, again, as Tyler said, take the human out of the loop and the quality of the reporting goes up by orders of magnitude. So if you can get the machines to do this for you, then everything works an awful lot better. This is a case um, in Jeremy's lab of a particular instrument that when it does an experiment, it actually writes a blog post of itself. And then you can link that into your data analysis process as the human who's taken something else on and taken it forward. And this can be as simple as something that just has a directory sitting on the instrument computer and when the instrument generates the file as part of the analysis, that file drops into the directory and a little directory widget just logs that out to the, to the lab notebook. It doesn't have to be complicated. It can actually be simple enough that even a scientist can use it. It's not rocket science or brain surgery. So you end up with a, with a link web of objects. I don't know if you can actually see the grey lines here, but th each one of those red spots is a post in my lab notebook. The grey lines are the links between them. And while it's not immediately obvious necessarily to, to a person looking at it the first time, there's information you can get out of these graphs by starting to look at it. We have an entirely different way of actually looking at the record. And so there's lots of interesting questions we can ask about can we tell whether an experiment didn't work by its position on the graph? And those kind of things. Um, I can certainly pick out some things, like the ones that aren't connected to things where I haven't done the recording properly, because they should be, things shouldn't be isolated from each other. So we have a web of objects, we have the process that connects them. But one of the problems we have is that this is not really structured data. It's, there's no semantic information here. And while I'm not a really strong semantic web person, I do believe that if there's a place where semantic web can make a significant contribution, it's going to be in science because we do have ways to a certain extent of structuring, describing the way we talk about things. So we have, we have a blog, 
so we can tag stuff. So that, that goes some way. In fact, it's slightly more complex than that. We actually have key value pairs, um, which create some interesting functionality. But what's the problem with social tagging and folksonomies? Uh, complete inconsistency, not just from one person to the next, but from one person to themselves a week later. So how can you actually enforce some structure that, um, that's, that helps solve that problem? And we do this using templates. Um, so this is a template. Um, this is the, the markup language that describes the post. And is this, am I pointing it the right way? No, I'm not. Here, we've got a little placeholder which looks for any posts where the key DNA is set to some value. So the percentage symbol is a wildcard. The box thing just creates a box. The way that's presented to the user, bearing in mind that before this the user had to mark this up by hand, and that's not something popular with biological scientists, is that we now present this as a nice table. And if we've marked up the samples that should go into this type of procedure correctly, they appear in a nice little drop-down menu. Much more appealing, much, much nicer way of dealing with it. So people are much happier to deal with this, this kind of this kind of interface, then they can type in a number as to how much they've used. And this works actually really well for stereotyped things, things that you do regularly. The problem with this is the problem we just had. How do you actually get the user to mark up the posts that are supposed to appear here to make their life easier? Well, partly because it makes their life easier, but actually what you also do is within these templates you actually set the metadata. So what we're effectively doing here is capturing what someone is doing by the context of the experiment they're doing, what kind of thing they're actually doing, labelling that up as to what it is, and then using that to capture other information and, and to make these links easy to make, make life, make life as easy as possible to the scientist. So that appears as a, as a set of things which you can then change in the final steps. And what actually happens is quite interesting. Um, so. We go through cycles of, of managing what our key values pairs are, how our templates work, and then sometimes they don't work and we do something new and they break and we cycle around and we reorganise and we do things. And then going back, you know, about 12 months later and looking at the way we organised things, it suddenly occurred to me that they actually mapped really closely onto a lot of the biological ontologies that people have spent the last 15 years arguing about how to organise. So, for instance, under DNA, um, we have oligonucleotides, these are very small pieces of DNA, and plasmids, circular pieces of DNA which are much bigger, um, and they map onto very closely into two terms that are subtypes of DNA in a biological ontology um, that is widely used by, by, by a number of bioinformatics communities. This guy doesn't, and because it maps sort of onto two different things, and actually we've spotted a problem with the ontology here. This, hasn't, this isn't because we've got things wrong. It's because part of the ontology describes the materials, what class of material, what class of object it is. But these two descriptions actually refer to how they were made. So they've mixed up process and characteristics. And because we've been forced to try and avoid those problems in the creation of our template, this kind of drops out and where we don't match, it tells us something about the thinking process that we went through versus the thinking process that the ontologists have gone through. And that's actually really very helpful. Um, but it doesn't make me popular with the ontology community. So we've ended up with um, this sort of linked graph of stuff. You know, we have, we've divided stuff up into sort of physical objects, process, and data. Okay, so, so that's great. We've got a web. So we're, so, so we're all sort of web native now, except, except of course we're not really thinking terribly web native because really if we think about holding data in our own system, which is what we do at the moment, um, we have these Excel sheets that are sitting inside blog posts that are not immediately exposed to the outside world. It would be much better where a data type is appropriate to go and put that in an external service which knows how to handle that kind of object. Something like Flickr, you know, if, if you're trying to generate a system for handling images and you're not using Flickr, then you really need to have a very good reason for doing that because this is a really great way of handling images. They've put an awful lot of effort into making this work for images. Um, so if you've got data that fits into that framework, which I do in some cases, 
here, and here are some examples. You know, let someone else do that heavy lifting. And there are examples across the web of data services, if you want to think of them that way, um, that are generic. Flickr, YouTube, Google Docs, SlideShare, ScribD, Internet Archive is about as generic as it gets. Um, Amazon Web Services. And then over on the right, there are some more specifically scientific things. There's beginning to become an ecosystem of services that actually understand scientific data types. Some of these are very old, some of them, some of them are newer. But what all these services have in common is that they understand how to deal with, with a data type. So on YouTube, if you want to bring that content back into a context which you're in control of, you go and grab the embed bit. Okay? So this is a syndication embed, make it easy for the user to drag the content back into their context while at the same time providing all the functionality on a dedicated site. So here's an example of that in science. This is ChemSpider, recently purchased by RSC. Um, it's uh, based around the concept of structure. So I'm going to grab this molecule. Uh, this is now some, this is a URI I could point to if I wanted to refer to glucose. And there's an embed button. And the embed button does what you'd expect it to do. You can grab the image, you can provide some sort of title for that, and then you grab the little bit of code, hope that the screencast catches up with you, and then you can paste it into your website. Having done that, you might want to add some metadata that's vis visible on this system, but basically, you've created a link, and that is now linked back to a resource that describes that molecule. ChemSpider can also allow you to embed various types of spectral data and, and do a lot of things that are really quite powerful. Um, this type of thing, I think, is going to become more popular, and there's a really serious question about how we actually pay for it, because there's, these things cost money to build. Okay, so I've talked about distribution. I've talked about moving, pushing things off into other, into other places, particularly for data. So does this work in practice? Well, here's a, I want to show you a, a quick example. This is a project um, that I, I've been involved with, led mainly by Jean-Claude Bradley at Drexel University, trying to do a specific set of scientific measurements, the details. The details aren't really important. Here is an experimental description. It's a document. It has various links in it, but it describes in general terms the process that was gone through to get a measurement. That is linked through to a Google Doc. We obviously use really sophisticated services because we're not computational scientists. You can see in the top left-hand corner that those data, each one of these lines is a measurement. Each one of those refers back to a lab book document reference. And what happens when you expose data on the web in a way that people can look at it? They go and analyse it for you. So a bunch of people came along and said, yeah, this data is really interesting. We'd like to do some visualisations over that. Um, it's in a Google Doc. It's immediately accessible. Um, so they can do it. So this is, again, this is using the Google Chart API. Um, and some of the best people in the world at doing this particular type of chemical visualisation came along, did this for us. All the pop-ups, again, linking back to resources, all linked up, all wired up, all making sense. I just love this picture. So... Um, if, you don't, if 2Ds, 2D isn't enough for you, then you can go into 3D. This is actually a five-dimensional graph um, built by Andy Lang in what is probably the most sophisticated 3D scientific uh, visualisation environment that I got access to, which is Second Life. It's really good for this type of thing. You can get into the graph and actually move around and look at it. It's brilliant. Okay, so we talked about pushing data out onto other services into appropriate services, but actually we don't really want to stop there. I mean... All the samples we could offload into other systems. There are lots of legacy systems for handling samples in scientific and research settings. LIMS, databases, blogs that we use, wikis, spreadsheets, all of these things are appropriate. And maybe some of them are appropriate for different types of samples, different types of um, approaches. Actually, the procedures are just documents. So what are we actually left with? If we, if we take this notion of the graph, the links between resources, and we take out all the objects and we put them in places that are specialised for handling with them, what are we left with? Well, we're left with the relationships between those objects. We're left with a feed that describes links 
between resources on the web. And that strikes me, and I guess John's going to come back to this point, as a fairly web-native way of dealing, dealing with making a scientific record. So, so this web-native lab, yeah, yeah, web lab record is distributed. You use services that are appropriate for what you've got, where they're available, and maybe generic services where they're not, but you don't necessarily try and control it all under your own. And it's a feed of relationships at core between those objects because that's the interesting stuff. How do these things relate to each other? Because once you've got that, then actually Google can do half of your data analysis for you. I can tell which one of my samples was the most important because if I do a search on our lab notebook in Google looking for those posts that fall into that category, the mo one that was most used is at the top of the hits. Google did my indexing for me. So there is a problem here, and I, I touched on it before. There is a, there's a real issue with, with trying to make these links semantic, trying to actually put meaning into them. And I don't necessarily mean in an RDF kind of XML kind of way. Just trying to get the meaning in is an extra step beyond what the scientists are already being expected to do. So we need tools that make that easy. Um, and I was really quite depressed about how we might go about doing this in a sensible way um, until relatively recently. So what we really need is a collaborative document environment, one in which it's fairly natural for people to author documents, to be working in free text, um, to be able to format things in a, in a sensible kind of way that makes sense to them, to not have terribly many restrictions on it, but also one in which when they type something that's relevant to the record or is irrelevant to a resource, that that can be automatically recognised, perhaps by a specific web service, that comes in, identifies specific things that are happening, and then formats that, places links to resources, perhaps recognises that you've created a sample and says, right, do you want me to create the URI for this sample? So what I'm showing you here is a screencast um, of a robot that's been developed for Google Wave um, by you and Adi at Nature Publishing Group. And what he's doing here is using little markers that have been put into the text to identify citations. It goes back to a, to a web service that then polls various sources for references and suggests, and then actually formats them and puts them in place. I was hoping to actually demonstrate live something where I'd um, do a, a chemistry-based based thing, but I ran out of time to try and put it together. Um, as I said, I am not a coder, so this is so the, the sudden realisation on the plane that I'd forgotten to download the Wave API, so <laughs> put the kibosh on that. Um, but I hope this demonstrates to you that we're actually at a point where document authoring systems can actually handle the recognition of specific regular expressions to pull down information that can be then marked up, that then could be stripped out and taken back to other web services, put into triple stores, linked up to whatever, however you like. And the whole drag and drop thing works here. So the user interface, I'm, I'm actually, if you, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm quite excited about Google Wave. Um, but whether it's this or whether it's something else, I think we're getting close to being able to actually make this, make this extremely easy for people. So I think we're actually in many ways very close um, to being able to do this in an effective way, to be able to provide for scientists something that is not horrible for them to use, something that's um, appealing, something that makes sense to them, and something that actually delivers some value back to them by making it easier for them to find stuff. Um, but there is one key point, and I'm doing this almost deliberately to lead into Michael's talk, um, realistically, you say web to the average research scientist and they think you mean Facebook or you mean Twitter or whatever. So when I talk about these things, when I go out and discuss them, realistically, the, the, the mainstream response I get is something like this. Um, this may be what most evangelists for anything get um, in actual practice. So. Yeah, people, are, people are worried, people are scared, people are concerned about all the issues that the other speakers are really going to talk about much, much better than I could. Um, so am I worried that this means we're not going to be able to achieve this agenda? And the answer is frankly no. What drives scientists is recognition, impact. What drives funders 
is the demonstration that the work that they are paying for is having an impact, having an effect. How do we measure impact in this day and age? Well, at the moment, we generate it, we, work, we measure it by the number of nature papers, number of science papers, which is why when you retract, re retract several science papers in a PNAS paper, things go badly, badly wrong. Um, most of my output is not published in the traditional literature. Significant proportion of it isn't. Anyway, there's data, there are research objects, there are images, there are talks, um, there are comments, and all of these things link up together. All of these things I expose freely on the web for other people to use. I do that because if you don't put them on the web and they're not freely available to use, they disappear from the network. This is the way we will be measuring impact in the future. What is the effect you have had on the global body of knowledge? And it, might not, it may not be Google, it may be someone else, it may be a different algorithm, but it's going to look like PageRank in one way or another. You want a high page rank, you need to be wired into the network. You want to be wired into the network, your content has to be available. If your content is available, it means that everything you're putting out there is open and free to use. What will drive the adoption of these type of approaches is competition, some of it brutal, but ultimately the reason why people will adopt these things is because they work and because the metrics we'll work with are going to be driven by them. The whole thing will feed off itself and in 10 years I think we'll be a lot further than even I imagined we'll be. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. So in the middle of your talk, you uh, mentioned offhandedly that so these tools uh, need to have a way of paying for themselves because they're free. A lot of them are paid for by grants or whatever, but that's not very sustainable. I was wondering if you're willing to pay, uh, like a pay for these services yourself out of your own research budget or out of your own pocket, uh, and how much would it be a reasonable amount for you to pay for them? Okay, so this is this is a um, an ongoing ongoing debate, or perhaps not a debate because. Most, most of the funders aren't really engaged. Um, are researchers individually going to pay anything much above the kind of $100 per chair per year rate? No. Um, not, if it's, not if it's an immediate budget line that they see on a regular basis, at least not at the moment. The model that I think is probably more interesting and which is more likely to drive adoption um, is that funders I say, funders want to see impact. Funders have to report back to their government masters that they're generating impact. And there's a growing awareness of the need for at least data sharing at some level to make that happen. So the BBSRC in the UK, Biological and Biotechnological and Biological Sciences Research Council, um, has a quite strong data sharing policy now, um, which essentially says you have to write what you're going to do um, and you have to be operating at a level of best practice for your discipline, which is almost meaningless. But because this is a component of the grant which is actually assessed, it's a point where people are going to compete. So if I get my one, what is the sentence I have to write in my grant to make sure I get 100% on that part of the, the measurement, is the question that the scientists ask themselves. And so the question is, can we persuade funders, because th this is really infrastructure, it's not... Um, it is, it, it's research infrastructure. It's not clear that um, disparate sets of services are really going to, um, mass, mass, mass numbers of services are going to be reliable enough or, or, or so they've got to be some sort of long-term funding. So I think if funders basically say, you know, here is a set of words and a process which if you go through, you satisfy our requirements. You know, you sign up to using this service or this set of services which reach a standard which we have set. Um, and that basically that means you're taking 2% or 5% of your total research costs and they get shoveled, top sliced and go straight across. Um, I think that could work. Um, then there's a the question of unfunded research. So effectively something like 70% of all research globally is, is, is essentially not funded. It's done on shoestring back of other bits and, bits and bobs. And there's lots of questions about how you make that work. 
The other question is, if you're the person who's aggregating this data and um, collecting it all together, can you directly monetize that? You have, you have access to the data better than other people do. Can you do make search services or other things over the top of that that can actually generate an income stream and is that enough to make it reliable? I'm not sure whether that's true or whether it would be the future. The other possible option is to turn the entire funding stream on its head and say that rather than fund projects that will happen in the future, we want to buy results that already exist. Which is a, which is a, is a thought experiment, not a proposal. <laughs> But it, it raises some interesting ideas about how you might, um, might make those things work. So also in the middle of your talk, you said a little bit about one of the advantages of uh, pursuing research actively in this area is the fact that other people can do your work for you. And I can see um, the attraction to that in a sort of scientific environment where the data is far more uh, numerous than your own resources. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about two things. And the first is maybe some of those sorts of advantages that might accrue to someone who works in an area of science, for example, fundamental measurements or something like that, where there's a very small stream of data that has to be analyzed very carefully. And sort of along the same lines, if you could say a couple of words about sort of not version control, but access control, some way of knowing all of all the work that gets done with your data, supposing that people are interested with it, what you should pay the most attention to and, and what maybe you can put on the back burner because maybe you don't trust those people if you want it to go back into your own uh, output stream. Okay, so, so yeah, so the obvious, the obvious wins are where there's huge amounts of data that you can never possibly analyze yourself and pushing that out. Astronomy is a great case. So there's you know, there's a strong argument, push the data out, let other people play with it where the data is expensive to collect and sparse, um, then the arguments for the scientists themselves are harder, harder to make. Um, there are two kind of ways of approaching it. One is that you still have the potential benefits from, from people looking at your data in different ways, using it for other purposes. Um, the other is the really harsh way of saying, well, it's not your data, it's the funder's data, um, which is the sort of hard line I tend to take. Um, but that doesn't make me popular. So you know, what are the, what are the, the good stories? So I mean, even the, um, the data I showed you um, of the experiment, this distributed experiment we did, um, that's actually, it was 250 data points um, collected by seven people in six countries. Um, and what was valuable about that was the way in fact, that different people did notionally the same measurement in different ways and got different answers. Um, so I think there are still, even, even where it's sparse, there are still advantages to getting people to look at it, to make criticisms. I think that's, that's very valuable. Um, but you've got to be, there's a psychological barrier to get over, which is, and it comes down to the fact that this concern over publication fundamentally is that if you're driven, driven primarily by the publication of the paper and you've got this highly valuable data set which is easy to analyse and someone else could grab it and do something with it, um, that's a hard concern to overcome. Um, and I think the only real answer is to say we have to value data publication as much as we value the publication of claims. Um, so the second part of your question was about how you you take oh. your data out there, how you rank the input back to you if you want to integrate it with your own research stream? Ooh, that's, yeah, okay, that's a really interesting question. And I haven't thought about it in a huge amount of detail precisely because we have the same problem as Titus does, is that essentially not very many people are using the data. Um, so the place where there is probably, in fact, actually, that's probably a very good segue into Michael's talk thinking about it, um, where he talked about collaborative projects and how they've been driven back in loops. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. um, so was that what you're going to talk about? <laughs> I can't think about two, more than one thing at a okay. time, and this has got me... Uh... <laughs> um, so, there's, so we have done a little bit of stuff looking at um, Google Analytics of what, what people pull down, where they're coming from, what the searches that people are doing. So one of the things Jean-Claude does is actually has a list of measurements we should do. And part of that is driven by the Google search terms of people arriving at the Google Doc. 
So it's a very crude example. If someone wanted to know what the solubility of X was in Y, they arrived at us, we don't have the answer, maybe we should work it out. So at a crude level, it's kind of been done, um, but we need to be much more sophisticated about handling the analytics to really know, and we're not, at the moment, we've got no way of measuring actual downloads and actual use. That said, if people are actually recording the fact they were doing something with data in an open notebook through which they ciphered us back and we got the we got the ping back, if you think of sort of track back ping back type mechanisms, which a lot of people have been thinking about and no one quite knows how to implement without having a spam problem, you can see how you might start to be able to aggregate that information back in a sensible way and use it to go into research. It'd be a great thing to do. Um, it wouldn't be the way funders would see it. I mean, shifting, shifting this because Google said I should, Google Analytics said I should shift my focus might not go down very well, but that's what data-driven science is about. Okay, I think we have one more question back here as we're setting up the evening for the next, so, so, uh, b both your talk, uh, the previous talk talked about the, the fact that no one would ever even look at uh, source code. And, and here you're assuming that people will really want to look at the full details of all the uh, UV spec uh, spectrographs and uh, you know all the failed experiments and so on and so forth. Um, mm -hmm. And I guess to uh, my question really addresses how do we go beyond just the data and and really look at the interpretation and and valuing those interpretations and and remixing and reanalyzing those interpretations. So we had a really fascinating conversation with um, Steve Easterbrook and a group of students yesterday about the problem of how you create entry points into these things. So the fact, it seems, I was thinking about this this morning, we need to create narratives, um, which because as humans, we approach these things through narratives, and those need, we need those to provide a route into the data, into the detail. Um, and we need to provide those narratives at different levels for different audiences. Um, the answer is that creating those is hard work. And it's a kind of chicken and egg problem that you've got to believe that by doing that, you're bringing people in um, and that they're going to add value so that you know, it's worth your effort. Um, we are just at the very first stage of submitting a paper at with, with which we hope to be able to link directly back from the published paper back to our notebook. We're doing that for the first time, um, which is an indication of how slow the publication process is. Um, <laughs> But at least that provides a routine. I think the first place is going to be in the published literature, linking back to, to data, pulling people in, getting them down to that layer, and then letting them explore, and then and finding out what they're looking for and what they're not finding. Um, but we also need to create more value. We need to have people believe there's more value in creating these narratives, um, whether they're blog posts or pieces or project websites or whatever they are. Some funders in the UK, um, GISC, um, are actually requiring project blogs now. Um, this is a, an information systems funding council, but it's an interesting step in that direction.